Um, last week, we explored some of the stories behind some of our favorite prayerful hymns, you might remember. But prayer cannot happen without the intervention of God's Holy Spirit. So today we're going to look into the history of four very moving hymns that were written to and about the Holy Spirit. I was thinking last week, I probably should have mentioned that it might be worth it to open your hymnal early. Because what I'm talking about, I'm talking about the, the different verses and the words in there. So it might be kind of interesting to have it in front of you if you wanted to refer to it. Because I don't know about you, but I only hear you know, like one third of what's being said most of the time. So, so um, the, the numbers are listed in, in the bulletin. And we are going to sing each hymn after I, I tell the story. But I think it's fruitful to maybe have um, the author's words in front of you. The Apostle Paul gives us two very important scriptures that reveal the unique activity of the Holy Spirit when we pray. In Romans 8, 26 through 27, we read, The Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Now some uh, translations say, through sighs that are too deep for words. You ever had one of those prayers where you just don't have the words that's like, God, hear my prayer. He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And in Ephesians 6.18, Paul urged believers to pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. So prayer is impossible without the agency of God's Holy Spirit in us. And so these four hymns to the Spirit that we're going to sing today, we already sang part of one, they all began as moving and passionate poems written in honor and praise of the Holy Spirit. A hymn is simply a poem. It's a religious poem. We think of a hymn as being words and music, but it's really just the words. The music was usually added sometime afterwards. Now the first hymn that we sang part of, Spirit of God, Descend Upon My Heart, we're going to sing the other two verses at the end. It's a deeply contemplative prayer poem that pours out the author's petitions in five verses. It's a masterpiece of Christian devotional poetry, and it's the work of George Crowley, who was an Anglican minister born in 1780 in Dublin, Ireland. And after serving a small parish in Ireland, he moved to London to pursue a literary career where he wrote in several mediums, including poetry, novels, history, and biography. In 1835, Crowley accepted the challenge to reopen a church in one of the worst slum areas of London, one that had been closed for over a century. Through his personal charisma and dynamic preaching, he attracted large crowds to St. Stephen's Church, and it became alive again. And in 1854, he developed a new hymnal for his congregation, and he published it as Psalms and Hymns for Public Worship. And the Spirit of God Descended Upon My Heart was first appearing in that hymnal under a title, Holiness Desired. It's the only hymn by Crowley to have survived. He wrote many, but it's the only one that we have today. Now, the words of this sung prayer are among the most passionate in the history of hymnody. From the first line, the poet entreats the Holy Spirit to descend upon his heart. The language of petition continues, wean my heart from earth. Wean's an old-fashioned word, isn't it? And we, we associate that maybe with babies and you know, weaning them from breast milk to, to uh, normal milk. But it's to, to take us away from the things of earth that bind us and move us through the very pulsing of our hearts and the Spirit stoops to our weakness and helps us to love God as we ought to love. And the poet continues his petition to the Spirit with the second verse. He doesn't hope for ecstatic experiences of dreams or prophecies or dramatic encounters with angels, simply that the Spirit would take the dimness of his soul away. The third verse recalls the poet's cry in one verse, in, uh, in verse 1, excuse me, to love God as he ought to love by recalling the greatest commandment to love God, our Lord and King, with all his soul, heart, strength, and mind, and with the image of the cross as the solace and refuge for him. 
And in the fourth verse, the poet seeks the spiritual strength and sight to feel that God is always nigh or always near through struggles of the soul, rising doubt, and the need for patience in awaiting answers to prayer. Now the final verse looks heavenward as the poet seeks to love God as thine angels above. With a consuming passion filling his frame, the Pentecost image of the heaven-descended dove soars above the hymn's climax when the poet imagines a perfect union with God. My heart, the altar, and thy love, the flame. It's a beautiful poem, and very much of its time. Um, it's a time of romantic poetry that was being written, and so it's kind of a, it's a, it's a love poem to the Holy Spirit. Frederick Atkinson, who was the organist and choir master at Norwich Cathedral, he wrote hymn tunes and anthems and complete Anglican services as well as songs and piano pieces. And he composed the music for Crowley's magnificent hymn poem. And it's suitably moody and majestic. It matches the cadence of the music to the prayerful power of the words. We're going to sing the last two verses at the close of the service. The next hymn is Breathe on the Breath of God. It's right nearby, it's, uh, next page, page before that, 227. And this also was, yes. God bless you. Yep. <laughs> it was originally written as a personal prayer to the Holy Spirit by the author, expressing spiritual truths in plain and simple words. It's remarkable in its simplicity, as it was penned by an extremely erudite scholar who was world famous in his day for his deep theological insights, his writing, and his teaching. Edwin Hatch was born in Derby, England in 1835. From a young age, he stood out for his work ethic and intellect. While attending the highly prestigious prep school, King Edward's School, his personal teacher noted his keen intellect, independent thinking, and solid work ethic. He attended Pembroke College, Oxford, and he joined the Birmingham Set, who was a group of young men focused on arts and literature in the poetry of Percy Shelley, the novels of Charles Dickens, and the art and architecture of John Ruskin. They were sort of the very highbrows, I guess, of their class. And after graduating, he served as a college professor high school rector and university principal. His great passion, though, was the study of theology. And he became well known for his theological lectures, chiefly the Brampton Lectures, which were published and translated into various languages. They kind of took fire all across Europe. And it was very unusual uh, in those days for English uh, scholars to um, get notoriety in Europe. It was usually the other way around. You know, the German theologians got not notoriety in uh, England, but not usually vice versa. The most famous publication, though, of this highly educated man ended up being his humble prayer, Breathe on me, breath of God. Mm -hmm. Hatch wrote this poem in 1878, and he kept it private for many years. It was just meant for God. And this adds to the unique nature of the hymn. As much as he loved complex thoughts and theologies, he understood that at its core, Christianity is something ex extremely simple, faith in God. In 1886, Breathe on Me, Breath of God was published by Henry Allen in the Congregational Psalmist Hymnal, like that, it's a congregational hymn. <laughs> and since then, Hatch's private prayer has become a prayer for many people to sing devotionally. The music for the poem was written by Robert Jackson, who was born in Oldham, Lancashire, England, and he was a graduate of the Royal Academy of Music, very prestigious in his day and still so today. But, you know, he, he was a hometown boy and he really just wanted to be home, so he returned to his home church, served 48 years as the organist of St. Peter's Church in Oldham. Breathe on me, breath of God, fill me with life anew recalls the picture of God living, giving life to the first human being when God breathed into Adam's nostrils and he became a living being. And when Jesus, after he was resurrected, came to his disciples and he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. That is the sense of this hymn. 
So let's sing all four verses of Breathe on Me, Breath of God. Please remain seated. We'll sing this in a very prayerful way. Number 227. usually two different people. But what's even more interesting is that the composer was a woman. And in her day in the 1800s, that was very unusual. Her name was Clara Fisk Scott. She was born in 1841. She was a classically trained musician who taught music at a ladies college. Again, very unusual for a woman to be a college professor. She published three hymn books in her lifetime, being one of the first women to ever do so. So lots of firsts for her, and I know this is something that we love to see in our own culture, that women are first, right? But uh, she really was a glass ceiling breaker back in her day. Uh, and she left this beautiful hymn as a legacy. In June of 1897, Clara Scott was tragically killed when she was thrown from a buggy by a runaway horse. But two years before her death, she wrote this hymn poem, Open My Eyes That I May See, and the music. And the hymn reveals an increasing receptiveness, God bless you, to the spirit divine, to the believer's spiritual senses depicted through her sensory organs. Jesus said of those who follow him, but blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. That's Matthew 13, 16. Open eyes lead to glimpses of truth. Open ears lead to voices of truth. The psalmist declared, Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. That's Psalm 51:15. An open mouth leads to sharing the warm truth everywhere. An open heart leads to sharing love with thy children everywhere. That's how Clara Scott expressed it. But the heart is the only organ that she included in her hymn that is not visible. Sometimes it may harbor deceit. Jesus knows our hearts, as he revealed in Matthew 9, 4. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? But Jesus also realized that the heart has the capacity for purity. He said in Matthew 5, 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Learning to use these spiritually sensitive organs requires patience and reflection. And the gentle 6-8 meter of Scott's music provides a subtle sense of 
dancing in tune with the spirit as we learn to see, hear, and speak the truth from our hearts. So let's sing, Open My Eyes That I May See. And again, it's found on page 354. <coughs> composition. The hymn writer was James Keith Manley, a Massachusetts native born in Holyoke, Mass. in 1940. He was a graduate of the Pacific School of Religion and Claremont School of Theology, and he wrote Spirit of Gentleness as part of his Doctor of Ministry thesis. The words and the music were composed in a lyrical style of a folk song typical of that period, and first appeared in a Lutheran contemporary songbook in 1982. Manly wove together myriad biblical passages that capture and describe the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Now Manly uh, was a pastor, he was a UCC pastor, but I'm not going to hold that against him because I love the hymn, and I think it is really solid theologically. I'm going to go through that a little bit with you. In exquisite poetic form, the first verse, and if you want to look at, at this while I'm talking about it, because it's this is a really dense hymn when it comes to the theology. The first verse recalls the creation account of Genesis, when the Holy Spirit formed the earth as we know it, hovering over the waters covering the earth and coaxing up the dry land. You moved on the waters, you called to the deep, then you coaxed up the mountains from the valleys of sleep. And from the land, Genesis tells us, all the living creatures of the earth were given life through the Spirit's power which Manly captured in his phrase, you call to each thing, arise from your slumbers and rise on your wings. Mm -hmm. The second verse recalls the creation of a nation for God 
who though they spent years wandering through a desert wasteland, the Spirit wandered with them through the giving of the Law of Moses. Throughout their spiritual blindness, as they forsook their God to worship idols, and in the mouths of the prophets sent by God to open their blind eyes to see him once again. Now verse 3 brings the singer into the stable to join with the angel's anthem and the spirit hovering over the manger of the newborn Christ child. Then the child grew into the man, Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, weeping for his people on a hillside outside Jerusalem, crying out to Father God in the silence of the night in the garden and ultimately sending his Holy Spirit like a rushing wind on the day of Pentecost to blow the breath of God's new creation through his people once again. Verse 4 fuses the future with the past. As the Spirit calls us to see the tomorrow of God's promise, when the ancient schemer's work of the bondage of sin will be broken from captive humanity, and the prophecy of God through Joel will be reality through the Spirit's power. I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Between each verse, there's a refrain that summons the believer's acceptance of the Spirit's power to free us from our bondage to sins, to stir us from our complacency that keeps us from becoming the new creations that God intends us to be, and from enjoying the abundant life that Christ died to secure for us. Now this hymn may be new to many of you. Uh, we did sing it um, when we had the Glory of God service here a few weeks back. But it has a lyrical form and it's easy to master, and I believe that after the first verse, if you don't know it, you're gonna sing it confidently. It's, let's sing this beautiful hymn together. It's Praise of the Holy Spirit. And it's found on page two, oh, no, 239. 239, there it is. Yeah. <laughs>
first attempt. <laughs> we'll have to sing that one again until we get used to it. But it is a beautiful hymn. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for who you are, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We thank you for creating us through your Spirit and your Word, our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that down through the ages of the earth and the years of our lives, you have never been silent. You continue to call out in our wilderness to free us from the bondage of sin and from the placidness of our own decisions to settle for a life that is good enough, but far below the mark that you desire for us, a joyful and abundant life. Stir in us, Father, a new passion for your word, your will, and your work. Cure our spiritual blindness, clear our eyes to see your visions, our imaginations to dream your dreams. May your spirit's wind loft us like eagles with boldness and steadfastness to no matter what the cost, in every circumstance, make the decision to follow you where you lead. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. amen. The writer of Hebrews urged believers, do not neglect to do good and share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. God is pleased when we share the blessings that he gives to us. And so in this spirit, let us give to God from our blessings. The morning offering will now be received. Will the deacons come forward?